live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Micron Insight 2018. Brought to you by Micron. Welcome back to the San Francisco Bay, everybody. We saw the sun rise in the Bay this morning in about an hour or so, we're going to see the sun set. This gorgeous setting here at Pier 27, Knob Hill's up there, the Golden Gate Bridge over there, and of course we have this gorgeous view of the Bay. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We're covering Micron Insight 2018, AI, accelerating intelligence. A lot of talk on, on, on memory and storage, but a lot more talk around the future of AI. So we got a great discussion here on the auto business and how AI is powering that business. Jeff Bader is here, is the corporate vice president and general manager of the embedded business unit at Micron. Good to see you again. Jeff, thanks for coming on. And Simon Enriger is the uh, vice president at BMW and he's also joined by Vijay Nadkarni, who's the global head of AI and augmented reality at Visteon, which is a supplier to automobile manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much welcome. for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for Thank me. you. Thanks. So you guys had a panel earlier today, which was pretty extensive. Um, and just a lot of talk about AI, how AI will be a platform for interacting with the vehicle, the consumer, the driver interacting with the vehicle. Also talked a lot about autonomous vehicles. But Simon, why don't you kick it off? Your role at BMW, um, let's, let's just start there. We'll do the same for VJ and then get into it. Yeah, I'm responsible for the research portion uh, that we do globally, in which is represented here in North America. And so obviously we're working on uh, autonomous vehicles as well as integrating uh, assistance into the car. And uh, basically what we're trying to do is to get use AI as much as possible in all of the behavioral parts of the vehicle that users have an expectations towards being more personalized and having a personalized experience. Whereas we have a solid portion of the vehicle that is going to be uh, as deterministic and aesthetic as we have it before, like all of the safety aspects, for example. And that is what we're working on here. And now, VJ Visteon is a supplier to BMW and other auto manufacturers, is uh, that Yes, right? uh, we are a tier one supplier, uh, so we basically don't make cars, but we supply auto manufacturers, uh, of which BMW is one. Uh, and uh, my role is uh, essentially AI technology at Visteon, uh, and also augmented reality. Uh, so in AI, there are basically two uh, segments that we cater to, uh, and one of them is autonomous driving, uh, which is probably our biggest segment. And the second one is infotainment, uh, and in that, the whole idea is to give the driver a better experience in the car by way of uh, uh, recommendations or productivity improvements and such. So, so that is so my team basically develops the technology and then we essentially integrate that into our products. So, so not necessarily self-driving, it's really more about the experience inside the vehicle. That is the infotainment side. The uh, and then on the autonomous driving side, uh, we of course are, uh, very much are involved with uh, uh, the autonomous driving technology, uh, which, is, uh, which has to do with detecting objects and also making the proper uh, maneuvers for the vehicle. And we're definitely going to talk about that. Now, Jeff, you sell to the embedded industry of you know, automobile manufacturers. We hear that cars have, I, I forget the number of microprocessors, but there's also a lot of memory and storage associated. Yeah, with and it, I right? mean, if you, if you follow the chain, uh, you have uh, Simon representing the, the, the OEMs, you have, uh, uh, Vijay uh, representing the tier one suppliers, we're a supplier to those tier one suppliers in essence, right? So, so we're providing memory and storage that then goes into the car and, and as you said, across all of the different sort of control and, and engine control and, and uh, computing units within the car, in particular into that infotainment uh, application and increasingly into the ADAS or advanced driver assistance systems that are leading toward autonomous driving. So there's a lot of AI, or some AI anyway, in vehicles today right, presumably. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, David, who did a wonderful job on the panel, he mm -hmm. thought he was outstanding, but he kind of got caught up in having multiple systems, like a, like an Apple CarPlay and mm -hmm. you know, your own system. I, I actually have a BMW, well, kind of a BMW, I have a Mini. Because mm. I'm afraid <laughs> it's going to be self-driving cars and I just want to drive a drive a car, car before yes. they <laughs> take it away from me. So. But, but you push a button if you want to talk to Siri and yes. you push another button if you want to talk to the Mini. I mean, it's. It's can you use it for different use cases, right? Exactly. I mean, that's and a, is that AI? I mean, AI is, is also about uh, adaption and it's also about integrating. So AI is, uh, is, is um, coming with you with the devices that you have with you anyway, right? 
So you might be an Alexa user rather than a Google Assistant user and uh, you would have that expectation to be able to ask to chat with your Alexa in your car as well. That's why we have them in the vehicle. Also, we have an own voice assistant that we recently launched uh, in the Paris Motor Show, uh, which augments uh, uh, the experience that you have with your own assistants because it factors in all of the things you can do with the car. So you can say there is a solid portion of AI already in the vehicle. It's mainly visible in the infotainment section. Right, and of course, I remember the first time, I'm sure you guys experienced too, that the, the car braked on my behalf and that hmm. kind of freaked me out. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then I kind of like it too. <laughs> Um, and that's another form of machine intelligence, right? I mean, well, does that, that count? Well, that counts for you. That had not. That has not necessarily been done by AI, because in 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 let's say self driving, there is a portion of pretty deterministic rule based behavior, and exactly that one, like hitting an object at parking you don't need AI to determine to hit the brakes, right? <laughs> there is no portion of AI necessary in order to improve that behavior. Whereas predicting the best driving strategy for your 20 mile ride on the highway, this is where AI is really beneficial. In fact, I was at a, a conference last week in Orlando, it's the Splunk mm -hmm. Show, and mm -hmm. it was a speaker from BMW mm -hmm. talking about what you're doing in that regard. Yeah. It's all about the data, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, being and, and able learning to about it. And, and, and turning data into, 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 into insights. Into right? better behavior. Yes. Into better expected behavior from whatever the customer wants. So, Vijay, you were saying before that you actually provide technology mm -hmm. for autonomous vehicles. So right. I, I got a question for you. Could an autonomous, t could today's state of autonomous vehicles pass a driver's test? No. No. Yeah. Well, would you let it take one? <laughs> uh, no. no. Well, okay. it, uh, yeah. uh, the right answer is it depends. I, I mean, uh, there are certain uh, companies like Waymo, for example, that do a lot, but uh, I, I still don't think Waymo can take a proper driver's test as of today. Uh, but it is, of course, trying to get there. Uh, but what we are essentially doing is taking baby steps first, and uh, I think you may be aware of uh, uh, the SAE levels, so level one, level two, level three, level four, et cetera, and level five. Uh, so we and most of the companies in the industry right now are really uh, focusing more on the level two through level four, and a few companies like Google, or Waymo rather, and Uber and, and such are f focusing on the level five. Uh, we actually believe that the level two through four uh, is, uh, the market will be ready for that, uh, essentially in the shorter term. Uh, whereas the level five uh, will take a little while to, you know, to to get there. So, everybody of course wants to know when we're going to have autonomous vehicles. I'm not going to ask you that question because it's such a spectrum of mm -hmm. self-driving. But I want to ask you the question differently. And I'll ask each of you. When do you think that driving your own car will become the exception rather than, than the, the rule? Well, I'd rather prefer actually to rephrase the question Please. maybe to where, not when. Because where, on a highway setting, this question can be answered precisely in roughly two to three years, the, uh, the functionality yeah. will kick in, and then it's going to be the renewal of the vehicle. So if you, answer, if you, if you ask where, then there is an answer within the next five years, definitely. Uh, if we talk about an urban downtown scenario, the question when is hard to answer. Yeah, well, so my question is more of a social question than it is a technology question, right? Because I'm not giving up my stick shift. Huh. <laughs> well, I will say, again, just an example, getting my 17-year-old to get his permit was like kicking a bird out of the nest. Right, Fly. get drive. They don't right. care. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's a permanent driver mm. on staff, basically, with me, right? So why? But, uh, I mean, when I was a kid, that was freedom. 16 I mean, you, years you old, you were racing so out stoked. The door, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And there is a, a large generational group growing up right now that doesn't necessarily see it as a necessity. Mm. Right? So n uh, not driving your own car, I think car share services, ride share, Uber, the so on mm. and so forth, are absolutely going to solve a large portion of the technology, of the of transportation challenge for a large portion of the, of, of the population, I think. 
but I agree with the, the, the earlier answers of it's going to be where you're not driving as opposed to necessarily when, I think. Yeah. And we heard today, of course, the, you know, talk about, I, I think the number was 40,000 uh, fatalities on the roadways. Mm -hmm. In the uh, U.S. In, in the, the U.S. In the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Uh, everybody talks about how autonomous vehicles are going to help attack that problem. Um, but it strikes me, talk about autonomous cars, why don't we have autonomous carts like in a hospital or even autonomous robots that aren't relying on lines or stripes or beacons? Uh, you w one would think that that would come before an aut autonomous vehicle. Am I missing something? Are there, are there, there, there are systems out there that, that I just haven't seen? Or well, I, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, videos of Amazon distribution centers. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're going to school on lines and beacons and they are. they're not really autonomous. That, that's fair, that's fair, yeah. So will we see autonomous carts before we see autonomous cars? I think it's a question of what problem that solves necessarily. Like take yeah, the Amazon sure. example. It, it's right. just as easy for them to know where something is yeah. and right, paint a line so they, yeah. right? Uh, you think about Micron's fabs, every one of our fabs is, is completely automated. It's a material handling system that runs up and down around the ceilings handling all the wafers and all the cartridges and wafers. Moving it from one tool to the next tool to the next tool. There's, there's not people anymore carrying that around or even robots on the floor, right? Uh, but it's a guided track system that only can go to certain you know, certain places. Well, right? the last speaker today too was talking about, and I remember when robots couldn't climb stairs and now they can do backflips. Right, and yes. You know, if you think about the list of things that humans can do that computers mm -hmm. can't do, the yeah. list gets smaller and smaller <laughs> every year. <laughs> so, it's kind of scary to think about on one hand. Is the, does, the, um, does the concept of Byzantine fault tolerance, you guys familiar with that? Does that, does that come into to play here? You guys know what that's I about? Know, I don't know what it is exactly. Mm. Uh, so it's a, it's a problem, and I, I first read about it with the, the Byzantine general problem. If you have nine generals, four want to attack, four want to retreat, and <laughs> the, the ninth sends a message to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> half to, to retreat or not, and then you don't have the full mm -hmm. force of the attack. Yeah. So the, the concept is if you're in a <coughs> self-driving both within the vehicle and within the ecosystem around the city, that mm -hmm. you're collectively solving the problem. So there, these are challenging math problems that mm. need to be worked out. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm not saying I'm a skeptic, but I just, when the more I read about it, the more hurdles we have. There's some isolated examples of where AI, I think, fits really well and is going to solve problems today, but this Singularity of vehicles seems to be a yeah. ways off. We have uh, a highly regulated environment. Obviously, public transportation or public roads, right, are a highly regulated environment. So it's like um, d it's different than curating pu playlists or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah. This is not so much regulated. Traffic and legislation isn't there yet. Mm -hmm. So especially, and it's it's designed for humans, right? Traffic, cars, roads are designed for human to use them and so the adoption to uh, they th th the design of any legislation any uh, public infrastructure would be completely different if we didn't drive as humans but we have it we have machines uh, drive them so why are uh, robots and carts not coming because the infrastructure really is designed for humans and uh, so I think uh, th that's what's going to be the ultimate slowdown is how fast we as a society that comes up with legislation, with acceptance of um, behavioral aspects that are driven by AI, uh, on how fast we adopt it. Technically, I think it can happen faster than yeah. we believe. Yeah. yeah, it's not a technology problem as, as much as it is the public policy, insurance yeah, companies, I'm sure, are yeah. going to weigh into this. Right? I mean, yeah. if you think about one of the advantages you can think of from a, from a let's say, even level four capable mm. car on a highway is platooning. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Instead of having X number of car links to the yeah. car in front of you, you just stack them up and they're all going yeah. in a row. That sounds great until Joe Blow with their 20-year-old Honda, you know, starts to pull into that lane. Mm -hmm. right? So you either say this lane is not allowed mm -hmm. for that or you create special you know, mm -hmm. infrastructure, essentially, that, that isn't designed for humans or is more designed specifically for the, for the machine-driven car, right? How big is this market? It f feels like it's enormous. For, I don't know, how do you look at the TAM? We can talk for the memory, I can talk the memory storage part of it, right? But uh, today, memory and storage, all of memory and storage for automotive is about a two and a half billion dollar market. That is going to triple in the next three years and, and probably beyond that, 
my visibility is not so good. <laughs> Maybe yours is better for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's then really driven by adoption rate and how fast that starts to penetrate through the car OEM lines and across the, the different car OEMs. And, and Vijay, your firm is, mm -hmm. uh, when were you formed? When, uh, how long have you been around? Oh, uh, Vistia has been around uh, basically since around 2001. Yeah, okay. So we were part of Ford, relatively and then Ford spun out Vistia on that at point. Right, okay, so, mm -hmm. so all right, so that's right, a so I mean if you innovation. Right, so Ford, then of course oh. it's been around forever. Yes. But it's Greenfield for you, for your, yeah. your group. Uh, uh, right. Whereas uh, BMW, a, you know, this is transitional, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. is it, is it, is it, are you trying not to get disrupted, or are you trying to be the disruptor, or is it just all sort of incremental well, business? Well, as a, as a 101 year old company, yeah, yeah. obviously people it think about you as being ripe for disruption, yeah. uh, and I think uh, uh, we do quite well in terms of renewing ourselves, coming from an uh, aeroplane business to a motorcycle business right. to it's car business, cool. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's because you're cool. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so I think uh, the answer is, are we fast enough? Are we fast enough mm -hmm. in adoption? Uh, and on the other hand, uh, it's fair to say that BMW, with all of its brands, is part of a premium thing. Yep. And so it's not into the mass uh, uh, pr uh, transportation. Um, so, so everything that's going to be eaten up by something like a uh, um, multi-occupancy vehicle, mass transportation in a smaller effort, right? This is probably not going to hurt the premium brand so much as uh, a typical Econo type of boxy car. Exciting times, gentlemen, yeah. thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. We, we, we gotta run, appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, so you so much. much. Okay, thanks Thank for watching everybody. We are out from San Francisco. You've watched theCUBE at Micron Insight 2018. Check out siliconangle.com for all the published research. Thecube.net is where you'll find these videos. Wikibon.com for all the research. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time.